I want to talk tonight about Islam and the cultural imperative. And I wrote an article on that, as the brother mentioned, by the same title. And then I wrote another one called Living Islam with Purpose. And that's pretty long, so nobody reads it. But towards the end of it, it goes through this again. And if you compare, you'll see that we add things there that were not in the original. So if you want to follow up, go to those articles. And let's try to keep our pictures up there. What happened? And I'm going to show you pictures, but I think you're going to have to wait a while to see them. Because first I want to talk a little bit. Because one of the most important things is to understand that the topic we're talking about tonight is a fundamental, undisputable part of Islamic law. So it's not just something that people thought they would do because it sounded good. You know, that uh, Islam must be compatible with the good cultures of all the people that we live among. And this is required in Islamic law. It's not like permissible, it's required. Okay, so we're not aliens anywhere. And if we were to say to you that understanding Islam today is difficult for Jews, Christians, and others, would you agree? Would you agree? No. Would you agree? You have to shake your head, one way or the other. This is a Muslim audience, they just sit there. Whereas a lot of the other ones yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? So we don't show expression. In fact, we think, oh, they really hated that speech. And it's like, oh, they were listening. <laughs> you could smile, you know, you could make some body movements, you know. Um, but you don't have to do that. But the fact is that understanding Islam today is ironically also difficult for us. And we so often misunderstand Islam today. And not only do we misunderstand it, but often we believe that our misunderstanding is the correct position. So this is something that has to be corrected. And it's not necessarily easy to correct. People have, have to have ears to hear. They have to be able to receive your message. A lot of our understandings of Islam today, among non-Muslims and among Muslims, as you know, are from bloggers, from journalists, of course, the media and all of its different approaches, uh, modernists, postmodernists, politicians, politicians often with purposes, right, with goals and ambitions, television announcers, and so on. And they confront us every day with different and conflicting visions. And that's why you know, you've, you've got to know where we stand. You've got to know what is what, what is right. A lot of the rhetoric in our community is culturally predatory. And that's the word that I got from my beloved Dr. Abdul Hakim Jackson. Brilliant word, culturally predatory. Um, and a lot of our contemporary activists and I don't want to blame anybody, I don't want to call any names. We, don't want, we want to be friends, we don't want to be enemies. But a lot of them fall very short of Islam's ancient cultural wisdom. And I hope you see that tonight, because you may be shocked by some of the things you see. And the thing is, you may say, where did they get that? But that's Islamic law in practice by very intelligent people. And often, some of our ideologues are completely, unmitigatedly culturally predatory. predatory. You know, that Islam's got nothing to do with anybody's culture. Put on that black abaya, and put on that white thumb, and get those hems up between your, you know, ankle and your, your knee. And even, that's not even, that's not even the Sunnah of the Prophet. Sunnah of the Prophet is very similar to the way that we dress men in Hajj, in the Ihram. They rarely ever wore sewn garments, or like the kind of thing I'm wearing right now. Sometimes the Prophet was given garments like that, but as a rule he didn't wear that. And a lot of these 
rhetorics and ideologies in our community have been deeply influenced by Western revolutionary dialectic, often anti-colonial, often post-colonial, and can you blame them for that? I wouldn't blame them for that. They were trying to liberate us. But the thing is, is they took over ideas. Terrorism is one of them. That's not part of our legacy at all. And terrorism in Islamic law is called hirada. And it is the biggest crime of all, with the biggest punishment of all. And again, Dr. Jackson has written about that. Um, but where do you get terrorism? From the anti-colonial and post-colonial movements. They use that in the 19th century, in the 20th century. And a lot of times our ideologues are very selective in the way that they read the Qur'an and the Hadith. Everything that agrees with them, they give you, and they interpret it their way, which might not be correct. And everything that doesn't agree with them, well, we leave that unmentioned. And often this ideological dislocation in the Muslim world is the result of the fact that we ourselves, in many of our countries, and sometimes here and in Canada, are culturally dysfunctional. When we didn't used to be like that, but today we often are. And as you know, even many of our nation states are dysfunctional. So that affects us deeply. Um, so we want to talk today about the fifth maxim of Islamic law. We have five maxims, we call them qawai kulliya, that are absolute consensus, right? What is number one? Al-umuru bi Things are judged by their purposes. And I want to elaborate. If you want elaboration, go to Living Islam with Purpose, where we talk about maxims in the last part of the paper. Al-umuru bi Things are judged by their purposes. Most of the law has purposes. So are you fulfilling that purpose? Al-yaqinu la yazuru bi Certainty is not removed by doubt. And again, you may have an idea of what that means and you may not. It really needs explanation. But we'll leave that tonight if you, if you want. Maybe if you have questions, you might say, what does that mean? Al-dhar Harm will be removed. No toleration for harm. No toleration. Whatever that harm is. And if you say, well, is that harm really great or little? We will consider every little harm to be great. That's the way the law works. If we, we always err on the side of preferring the victim. That doesn't happen in many of our communities, does it? And al mashaqqatu tajribu taysir, that unnecessary difficulty, brings facilitation. We don't want unnecessary difficulty. You've got enough difficulty in life as it is. You have to pray five times a day. You have to fast in Ramadan. You have to study. You have to take care of your family. You've got a thousand things to do. That's difficult. That's good. But we don't want unnecessary difficulty. And then number five, which we want to talk about tonight, and this is consensus of all the scholars. Al-Ada Muhakkama. Al-Ada Muhakkama. That cultural convention has the power of law. Of course, as you see, we don't mean every cultural convention, we mean the good ones. The good ones. And we'll give you some examples tonight. So any good cultural convention of the people we live among, we will honor and adopt. And in doing that, we're following the Sunnah of the Prophet and the Quran. Okay, so we're not innovating. Because as Islam spreads through the world, we have to know the people we live with, and we have to accept from them the things that are good. And don't get uptight, you know. Don't get worried about that. We're not going to destroy your beautiful culture that you have already, and you're the culture maker, you do what you like. The thing is, is that you've got to have a culture, ultimately, that is compatible with the people around you. We don't give up Islam, but that welcomes them into Islam. And it's something they can recognize. And you'll see lots of examples of that in the slides. And historically, our great scholars 
would say many things about this. And one of them uh, is that Islam is like a crystal clear river. Its water has no color, like this water right here. Okay, but in this cup, it's the same water, but it looks green, doesn't it? It looks green, but it's not. It's the same. And even if it looks here, it's green. But it's the same water as here. So Islam is like a crystal clear river, but it takes on the color of the bedrock. That's what they say. So if the water flows over black rocks, it looks black. Even though it's clear. If it flows over jade, it looks green. If it flows over sand, it looks sandy. And what they mean by that, and you'll see this, and you probably know this already, Islam in China looks Chinese. And Islam has been there for over 1,400 years. And they are Hanafis like most of you. And they are strict Hanafis. But they fit into China beautifully. Okay? So, um, you know, in Indonesia, Islam looks like the culture of Musanta. It looks Indonesian. It looks Malay. Of course, when the British came in and the Dutch came in, they said, would you build real mosques? Your mosques would have to domes. They have to look like Moroccan. And a lot of us did that, didn't we? You'll see that in Malaysia. You'll see that in other countries. And then we have to pay most of the budget just to get the algae off the dome. Whereas, you know, in the old traditional Malay and Indonesian mosques, you don't have any problem with that. It's cool, it ventilates, and it's sacred in the eyes of the people of Nusantara. Nusantara are the island people of Malaysia, of Singapore, of Indonesia, of Brunei, and of the Philippines. Okay, these are great people. Great people. And in, in Africa, Islam looks African. Okay, wherever it goes, it takes on the local color. But the water remains clear. Okay, the water remains life-giving. Okay? Delicious. Not green after all. Okay, but this is the way that Islam is supposed to be. Um, so Muslims were not culturally predatory. And today, who's going to believe you when you say that? Because today most of us are really culturally predatory. But we didn't used to be like that. And um, I want to give you an example. This is from Muslim. This is a beautiful hadith, and uh, I learned this from one of my great teachers, Sheikh Khaldun al Ahdab, one of the greatest muhaddiths of this time. And he's the one who brought this to my attention, and he said, Understand this hadith. So, this hadith is about the Rum, who were the Byzantines, the Romans. They're the biggest enemy we've ever had to this day. Because of the Americans, the, you know, the Europeans, they're also room. And they, you, you, they are difficult. They are difficult. Even to this day, they are. When you talk about Islam, they, they out the door. Don't want to hear anything about it. And of course, that's gotten worse since 9 11, but it's always been bad. It's never been good. The room constituted our most formidable enemy. And Amr ibn al-As, God be pleased with him, as you know, he's one of the great commanders who defeated the rule. He was a great commander. He's a great commander. And um, then al-Mustawrad al-Qurashi, who's another companion, he came to Amr, he said, you know, at the end of time, the room will be most of mankind. And Amr says, what are you saying? And he's like, that's my enemy, thanks a lot. <laughs> like, so they're gonna win? He's like, what are you saying? He said, no, I heard the prophet say that. He said, in the end of time, the room will be most of the people. Now, we won't go into the interpretation of that, but a lot of us actually follow the room in the way we dress and so forth. So their culture is the dominant world culture. Whatever it means, we'll leave that for the time being. So what did Amun do? He thought about that, and this is what my teacher, Dr. Sheikh Khaldun, said, this is what the Prophet taught him to do. So he thought about that, and he said, 
if what you have related is honest, know that they have four excellent qualities. Wow. In other words, well, why would that be? Because they have some excellent qualities that make them different from a lot of other people. Okay, see how he's thinking? And again, my teacher said he was trained this way by the Prophet. This is the cultural imperative because you've got to know your people, even if they're your enemies. You've got to know them. So they have four excellent qualities. They are the most forbearing of people in times of discord. They don't lose their heads. Many of us do, don't we? But they don't. They are calm, even in war. And their cities are being bombed to bits. So they are the most forbearing of people in times of discord. This is Amr ibn al-As. They are the quickest of people to recover from calamity. Again, look at the Germans after World War II. The whole country is blown to smithereens. And then 20 years don't pass, and it's the economic miracle. And it wasn't just them. Others did that too, didn't they? The Russians, the English, and others. So they recover quickly. And they are the most likely of people to renew an attack after retreat. So they will retreat, but be careful, because they're coming back. They're coming back. And then he said, and they are the best of people toward the poor and the orphan and the weak. Wow. These are your enemies. These are deadly enemies. And you know that when we fight each other, we dehumanize our enemies. That's what we did to the Germans in World War I and World War II. They were Huns. That's what we did to the Japanese. They're monkeys. We didn't say, no, they have excellent Zen qualities. We didn't say anything like that. But see, this is what he does. They have good qualities, and this is the way we should be. And these people have good qualities, all of these people, whether they're black, whether they're white, whether they're Hispanic, whatever they may be. And of course, they've got some qualities that need to be helped. But you have to know them. And then Amr thought about it some more. And he said, they have a fifth attribute that is both beautiful and excellent. They are the best of people in checking the oppression of kings. Wow. Doesn't that give you goosebumps? It gives me goosebumps. See, and that means, this is why you will conquer them. Because you know them and you respect them. This is why Salah al-Din would do that later, because he knew them very well. He knew their psychology. So, this is part of the cultural imperative. You've got to know your people. You've got to know these people. Um, now again, when we say we follow the cultures of other people, we mean the good culture. Doesn't mean we're going to start kissing each other and dancing and drinking wine. No, we don't do that. But you do obey the traffic laws, right? Well, probably not. <laughs> you know, but you should. And it's actually better for you. Okay? And um, so, of course, one of the things that people often ask is, how does this relate to the Prophet's statement that man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum Whoever imitates a people is among them. What our scholars say is that tashabbu is not tashabbu. So tashabbu, and I know it's probably difficult for you to hear the difference if you're not Arabs, but they're two different words. So tashabbu, that's the one he uses in the hadith. And that's when you imitate people because you are not proud of yourself. That's when you imitate people because you want to be accepted by them. That's when you imitate people because you're ashamed to be a Pakistani or an Indian or an Arab or whatever. That's very bad. And that's very psychologically unhealthy. But tashabbu, that we are similar, that's not the same. So you wear clothes, I wear clothes. I wear a hat, maybe you don't wear a hat. You know, there's similarities, but it's not tashabbu. I'm not imitating you because I'm ashamed of myself. This is my favorite dress, by the way. I love it. My sheikh gave this to me, you know, years and years ago. But you think I dress like this all the time? No, because it wouldn't be appropriate, would it? Here, I love it because you don't mind. Maybe you even like it. I like it. 
But if I go to the University of Chicago, I don't dress like this. They would say, welcome, but they say, why is he wearing the turban? Why is he wearing the turban, right? And they don't listen to a word you say, like, it's a crazy. And if I become Muslim, I have to put on a turban, I'm out of here. Right? So, um, you know, you can dress in different ways. And you have to dress appropriately. Um, in any case, uh, I want to give you another example from the Blessed Prophet. And this is what we call the sons of Arfida. Banu Arfida. And Banu Arfida, this is the language of the Prophet. He knew so much, he knew everything. So Banu Arfida, the children or the sons of Arfida, is the most respectable way that you can refer to an Ethiopian. You could call him the, the Ahbash. Habashiyun. You could call them other things, but he called them Benu Arfida. And what was the occasion? And the occasion was that when Ja'far al tayyar God be pleased with him, came to Medina from Ethiopia. He made his hijrah now to Medina. You know he made the hijrah to Ethiopia during the Meccan period. And he doesn't come alone. He brings with him a whole contingent of Ethiopian converts, among the first Africans to come into Islam. Bilal, of course, was also an Abyssinian. And do you think they love the Prophet? They can't control themselves. They love him so much. And they fast the whole month of Ramadan. And they're in heaven, and so would you be. Right? And then on the day of Eid, they just do an Ethiopian thing. They get out their swords, they get out their spears, they get out their drums, they begin to beat their drums and dance sword dances and spear dances in the mosque. Not outside, in the mosque. And Umar al farouq he was a big, tough person. You don't mess with him. Very big, very tall, very strong. He didn't like that. He said, what are you doing? You know? And so he said, stop it. And then the Prophet then he said, take it easy, Allah. Take it easy. Don't frighten them. And they said, play your games, Banu Arfida. Play your games, Banu Arfida. So that the Jews and Christians know that we have ampleness in our religion, that our religion is not rigid. And also so that they know that Ethiopians can be Ethiopians. You don't have to become Arabs. You be Ethiopian, and you dance, and you have drums, and you have swords, and so forth. Okay, so this is an incredible hadith. And then they continued to dance. They were still a little bit frightened about it by Allah. <laughs> but the Prophet said, no, just take it easy. And then he lifted Aisha up over his shoulders, and she put her cheek next to his. And she watched and watched and watched until she got tired, and they said, okay, I want to get down. And they just went on and on and on. They were delighted. And a lot of people are like that, aren't they? A lot of Africans dance. That's what they do. Drums and dance. Go to a wedding and maybe you won't like it, but they dance. Okay? And uh, this is part of their culture. And of course you want the dance to be good. You don't want it to be sexually beyond the limits. Okay? And they don't do that. In fact, the women dance with the women. That's what it is. And then the men dance with the men, but they dance. Okay, so this is very beautiful. And the Quran says in the heights, uh, it says, except from the people, what comes naturally for them. This is my translation. Um, you know, command what is customarily good and turn away from the ignorant without responding in kind. Okay, this is 7 199. And this is the way the Fuqaha understand that, that verse. Um, you know, so, except from the people, خُذِ وَأْمُرْ عَنِ Okay? So it's like, except from the people, what is customarily good? Uf. Command them, uh, I'm sorry, af, which is what comes natural for them. That's what the Fuqaha said. Command what is customarily good and turn away from the ignorant that is without responding in kind. Um, Muhammad Asid translate that, make due allowance for man's nature 
and enjoin the doing of what is right, and leave alone all those who choose to remain ignorant. Ibn Abdiya, who is one of the great commentators of Muslim Spain, um, he said about this verse that it upholds the sanctity of indigenous culture. It upholds the sanctity of indigenous culture and grants sweeping validity to everything the human heart regards as sound and beneficial, as long as it is not clearly repudiated in the Sharia. Okay, so we're not going to drink wine, and we're not going to do crazy things. Okay, but nevertheless, you know, we are going to adopt the things that are beneficial. Um, and this verse is often cited by our great jurists as one of the main proof texts for Al-Ad al The good cultural convention has the power of law. Abu Yusuf, uh, the great Hanafi jurist, um, he said that much of what became the Prophet's Sunnah was made up of acceptable pre-Islamic Arab cultural norms. The Aqiqah is one example. And you know that. You don't have to think very much to see that. So much of the law was simply, they do that, this is okay, we'll keep it. Even they would eat these dub lizards. And Khalid brought one to the Prophet. So suddenly he said, I don't like to eat it, but you can. Because this is your culture, I don't like to eat lizards, but you can. Okay, so he accepts that culture. Um, and therefore, the principle of tolerating and accommodating such practices among Arabs and non-Arabs alike, in all their diversity, Abu Yusuf said, is a supreme, overriding prophetic sunnah. It's sunnah. Abu Yusuf understood that the recognition of good local cultural norms fell under the rubric of the Sunnah. Let's look at as sarakhsi who is one of our great Hanafi Usulis. as sarakhsi said, really in the vein of Abu Yusuf, he said, whatever is established, whatever people do, by sound custom is equally well established by sound legal proof. You understand that, don't you? See, so you're following the Qur'an, you're following the Hadith, you're following the Sunnah when you respect the good things of the people around you, whether they're black, whether they're white, whether they're Latino. And of course, you do what you want to do. If you're from the Arab world or from the subcontinent, you're, continent, you're proud of that. That's also part of your culture. That'll be part of your subculture, I would recommend. But you know, you're not going to give up your identity. You love who you are, you love your past. You have every right to do that. But we also want to not be alien in this land. And you're not. This, this place is not alien at all, in my eyes. Very beautiful. You've done a great job. Okay, so let's look at a few more, and then we'll go to the slides. Um, judge Abdul Wahab al-Baghdad, one of the great, great judges of Islam. He says, to reject good cultural usage Good customs has no meaning at all. Don't think you're following the sunnah, you're violating the sunnah. To follow sound custom is an obligation. Okay, and when you see these pictures, you'll see we knew that. We did that. It wasn't just we thought, well, this would be cool. Ashatabi, who is one of our great legal theorists of Granada, is unquestionably one of the most brilliant legal minds in Islamic history. He cautioned us that juristic incompetence, the incompetence of the mufti, of the faqih, or of the mujtahid, could never impose a difficulty upon the people harsher than to require them to repudiate, to give up, and to reject their sound local customs and conventional usage. Leave the Ethiopians alone. Let them be Ethiopians. Let the Chinese be Chinese. They don't have to become Arabs. We don't even want that. Although if you go there today, 
You will see groups that like, get rid of these Chinese mosques. We're going to have a mosque like we have in our country. Change those clothes. You're going to look like us. And that's culturally predatory. And you're destroying their whole culture. And that also puts them in danger in the eyes of the Chinese because they become alien. By contrast, as Shatibi insisted that the art of handing down fatwas must be in harmony with the good aspects of local culture and that this fulfills one of the basic Islamic legal obligations of buttressing society's masalih, your well-being. Why do we have traffic lights? So we don't die in car accidents every day, right? So you know that's good. We're not going to know that's not sunnah, there's no hadith about that. No, you follow the good cultural conventions of the people. And let's take one more. This is another jurist called Tasuli. He teaches judges how to be judges. And he said, allowing the people to follow their good customs, their good usages, and general aspirations in life is obligatory. You don't tell African American Muslims that you've got to become Arabs. No, you be African Americans. You be proud of your past. And you build on that past. And, in the, and that's the way we work. Wherever we went, I believe that Muslims came to this land long before Columbus. And I would love to give you a presentation on that to show you that we've got strong evidence for it. If they did, they would have blended in with any of the First Nations, Cherokee. They were in the Cherokee. We've been told by Cherokee women of the Wolf Clan. We're the shamans because we have Robert Crane, you know, whose name is Brother Farouk Abdul Haq. He's quarter Cherokee. And his, he told his grandmother, I became Muslim. She said, We always had Muslims in the Wolf Clan. But we didn't tell the white man. Okay, we, we kept that secret. The Iroquois were probably like that. The Apache were like that. But this is also because we don't clash with their culture. We're not going to tell the Aborigines of Australia. You've got to give up all this treasure you've got. No, we may not like everything they do, but we can live with them respectfully, and we have to. So he says that uh, allowing people to follow their good customs and usages and general aspirations in life is obligatory, not permissible, obligatory. To hand down rulings in opposition to this is gross deviation. And tyranny, chaur. That's serious, isn't it? This is, a, this is a judge talking. And he doesn't play around. See, so this is very important. Now what we'd like to do is to conclude by taking a little trip around the Muslim world. So let's look at... Um, hmm, I can't see my slides. There's a plant here. Would you mind... Yeah. kindly move in this plant a little bit. So we're going to begin in Moscow. In Moscow. We're going to see something that I don't think anybody here has ever seen before. And even the children probably have seen. Okay, so let's look. Okay, let's go. Next one. This, you know, there we go. Stop, stop, stop. Uh, oh, no, go, go. Okay. Isn't that funky? Doesn't it look like a mosque? Doesn't it? Kind of like Disneyland mosque. <laughs> right? But what is that? That is St. Basil's Basilica, built by Ivan the Terrible, who crushed the Golden Horde, who were all Muslims, of the Volga River. The Volga River was controlled by the Muslims for hundreds of years. And the Russian Empire only begins by knocking out the Volga Tatars. And he's Ivan the Terrible. He deserved his name. So he, he's going to force you to be a Christian. He will tear down your mosques. But then he came to Kazan, which is one of the great Tatar cities of the middle Volga. I've had the honor to be there. And he said, this mosque is just too beautiful. So he had Tatar architects take it apart. 
block by block, tile by tile. They shifted by ox cart to Moscow, and then he had Tatar architects rebuild it, but not as a mosque, as a basilica. But here you get an idea of what the mosque looked like, and there's only one thing in that which is not from the mosque. Who knows what it is? Cross. Sorry? It's a cross. Can you speak loudly? Crisscross on the top. Um, okay, but what's under it? The Golden Dome. Okay, so that cross and the Golden Dome, that is orthodox. Nothing else is orthodox. Nothing else. So all those Tatar mosques were destroyed. Right? That makes me sad, but that's what happened. They were destroyed. But you see their cultural imperative that they created mosques that speak to the Russian soul. They created mosques that spoke to the Russian soul. And that's why this is the logo of Russia, isn't it? The logo of Russia. So it means we were doing what we're supposed to do. I went to Kazan. I met the imam of the mosque. Now they have a big mosque there in that place. And um, he was killed by extremist Muslims later. He was a beautiful young man. And I asked him, it is true, isn't it, that St. Basil's is made from the bricks and the tiles of your old mosque? You know what he said? He said, we don't like to talk about that. And then I said, yeah, well, you know, tell me more. <laughs> you know, because like, I do like to talk about that. And he said, no, he said, the Russians can have the tiles and the bricks. He said, we want their souls. We want them to come into Islam so that they don't die of alcoholism or of drug overdose and so forth. So we'll let them keep that, we won't say a word. Is that smart? That's a big lesson for me. That's a big, I wish I could learn that lesson. Because if you know our history, we've got lots of tragedies. Don't think that Palestine is the first tragedy. Don't think that Syria is the first tragedy. We lost maybe 20 million Muslims in China in the 19th century, massacred. Okay, this is sad stories, but how are we going to talk about that? We have to be careful because do we want revenge? No, because the people who did that, they're not around anymore, are they? So let's go to the next one. Next slide. Okay, and you know what that is. Parthenon, Athens, Greece. What in the world does that have to do with Islam and the culture in Paris? The Ottoman Turks, God bless them, the Ottoman Turks were great. Don't ever believe anyone who says the contrary. And they're one of the signs of God, of buttressing this deen before the Day of Judgment. And the overthrow of Sultan Abdul Hamid is fitnatul ahlas. The Prophet told us about that. Not good, not good at all. You know, Sultan Abdul Hamid was a great man. He was a great man. And he cared about us, and he cared about the Rohingya, he cared about the Palestinians. Okay, so that was a big loss. But the Ottomans ruled Greece for centuries. And while they ruled Greece, Greece was 50% Muslim. The base of the Ottoman Empire was where? Where was their demographic base? And my wife is now here, I'm happy to see her back there. She always says, why do you ask questions that nobody knows the answer to but you? But the base of the empire was, was Bulgaria. Not, what is today Turkey? Bulgaria was 80%. What is today Turkey? Anatolia was 50%. And Anatolia was basically just like Greece. You had all kinds of Greek-speaking Christians there. They spoke a slightly different type of Greek than the Greeks of Athens and so forth. They were Greeks, ancient Greeks. And you had Armenian Christians as well. Okay? And Hungary was 30% Muslim. You know, you can go on and on. When the Ottomans come into Athens, first of all, when they conquered Constantinople, they adopt the Byzantine church. They protect the Byzantine church. They cleaned up the Byzantine church, and the Byzantines loved them. I'm sorry, you know, the Greek Orthodox Church. You know, and the Greek Orthodox Church loved them. Don't believe anything to the contrary, because that's not true. They won the love of the Orthodox Church. And the Orthodox Church stood by them faithfully until the end. 
And of course, now you see that's not the case with Serbia and so forth, but those are all later on. That's nationalism, later on. But when they come into Greece, they took the Parthenon. Do you think that offended the Greek Orthodox Church? No. Because the Greek Orthodox Church had an attitude towards the pagan Greek past that made them not interested in that at all. So they've got their churches. They don't want that. So the Ottomans said, we will take it. And during the whole Ottoman period, the Parthenon was completely intact. It was blown up by Greek nationalists in the War of Independence in the 19th century. So you see it now in ruins, but during the Ottoman period it was like that. If you go there, you can even see the Arabic calligraphy and so forth. Now, what do you think about that? Was that an intelligent cultural statement? Because, like, aren't you saying to the Greeks that we really admire you? That, you know, Toynbee says the most beautiful building in the earth is this one, the Parthenon and the Blue Mosque. So it's like we will honor the Parthenon. We didn't break any statues, we covered them. Sometimes we plastered over them. So you wouldn't see anything offensive there. But that was our Salat al -Jubar. And that's the cultural imperative. Let's go on. Okay, now we go to China, and probably we have to move a little bit more quickly. A lot of you have been there. Okay, now this is, these are ancient Chinese mosques. Um, you know, they are beautiful. And those of you who have been there, I think that you're like me, that when you go into them, you don't want to come out. You pray there, you say, I don't want to leave. And you go through gardens to get there, which are Zen gardens to empty your heart. So your anxieties are gone. When you go to the mosque, you don't think about anything but your creator. And this is very Chinese. And they did it also by the explicit permission of the emperor. Because Islam, when it came into China, which is in the days of the rightly guided caliphs, probably, or most, some say the prophets, also, they were an official Chinese religion from the beginning. And we brought, and the emperor asked for armies. He said, send me your Muslim armies. You know, and I want them to defend me against the Mongols, against the Tibetans, and I will honor them. And he did. And so we stood by the Chinese emperor. Okay, Muslim today is like, what? But that's what we did. And in fact, he said, bring the soldiers, but don't bring any women. So what's he got in mind? I'm going to marry you to Chinese women, beautiful Chinese women. But, and then we'll do it again and again, so after a while, you basically become Chinese. You can still be Muslims. But I don't want you to bring your Persian or Arab women. Come and I'll marry you. You can bring soldiers that are not married. Okay, that's what he did. Chinese are smart. They're very smart. Let's keep going. Okay, that's a minaret. Again, this is what we call North Eastern China. You've got different cultural zones in China. Northeastern, Northwestern. They're different. And then Southern. They're very different, but they're all beautiful. Okay, and that's their minaret because Chinese don't like tall buildings. So they don't want you to have a big, big minaret. That's in the Northeast. Keep going. Okay, keep going. Keep going. Keep going, keep going. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Go back, please. Okay. So, Chinese, you know, it's difficult for the Chinese to say some things we say. You know, like Islam, they say, Yisilan, Yisilan. Okay, so, and then you say Yisilan, and of course you write it like fragrant orchids or something, and they read it Yisilan. So that's nice, not Donald Duck, okay? But you know, they use these different ideograms and they read yi, si, la. But that means to the Chinese, you're not Chinese because I don't understand what yi, si, lan is. So is that good? I mean, you have to think about this, brothers and sisters, because Islam terrifies most of the white people out there, except for the really cool ones, right? And a lot of them is like, you're, you're a Muslim? Oh my God, you know? We're gonna have a heart attack. Sisters wearing those terrorists, look at all of them, you know? 
That's what they are, aren't they? A lot of them are that way, and you've experienced that. I know my wife has, and a lot of others have. Okay? So maybe we also could use Islam, because we love it, but we could also find another way to refer to it. You know? And that's what the Chinese did. So they said, it is Islam, if you can pronounce it, fantastic. But it's also Qing Zhen Chao, the religion of Qing, which is pure, and Zhen, which is real, the religion of the pure and the real. Okay, like you really won big time. Because then the Chinese is like, oh, really? Like that sounds a lot like ancient Chinese religion. Sounds a lot like Confucius and Lao Tzu. Really, tell me more. See, that's smart. And they did that in all kinds of things. So, for example, you say the unseen for Ghaib. You can't say that in Chinese. So they say the color world and the no color world. Because that's what Chinese understand. The unseen means there's no colors. They're kind of smart, actually. Chinese are kind of smart. Okay, so let's go. So that's a Jin Jin Jin. Then now we've come down into the south. This mosque is incredible. This mosque is in Shanghai. And this mosque is, now you're in the south. You see the colors are different, the woodwork is different. Um, it's red, all the, all of it is by order of the emperor. And you want to know how you can tell that? Go to the next slide. You, you see that? Well, you can't see it very well, but you know, on that wall, there is, of course, a black roof, a black little roofing, right? But that's actually a dragon. Again, if you go there, you can see that clearly. It's a dragon. Why you put a dragon on the mosque? Why do you think? Does that mean this belongs to the emperor of China? You steal anything from this mosque. You break any windows. <laughs> Oh my God, you've got to deal with the emperor and he'll cut your head off. Because he's basically got one punishment. Cut their head off. See, so like you try to do anything in this mob, but you've got to go for the black dragon and that is the emperor. So it's guarded by the black dragon. Let's keep going. This is the same mob. You see how they, and you know this, the Chinese Arabic calligraphy, which they developed over 1,400 years. And you know it's Arabic, but it does fit in with Chinese, doesn't it? Yes. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Keep going. See? And then you see, they developed this incredible Chinese Arabic calligraphy. But, and you've probably seen the calligraphers do that, because they come to visit us sometimes. Right? And they do it usually two strokes. Right? And then they put Chinese calligraphy, classical Chinese <laughs> calligraphy, that tells you a beautiful story about what this means. And then he puts his Chinese authorization and his Muslim authorization, Islam and the cultural imperative. Because the Chinese love calligraphy and so do we. See, that's beautiful. And now you're speaking to them. You want them also to be able to read. And I've been to China and taken Chinese guides who are non-Muslims, they've never been in a mosque and they're just reading everything. Primordial religion from the foundation of heaven. It's four idioms. Primordial religion from the foundation of heaven. Wow. Good job, isn't it? Isn't it? It is. Let's keep going. Okay. What are those? Looks like Chinese, doesn't it? But it's Arabic upside down. And it's the Asma'ul Husna. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Al-Malik al is that allowed? Yeah, really. Don't, don't worry about it. But see, it's the Chinese like that. They like that. Let's keep going. Okay, now we want to come to Nusantan, which is Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore. Let's keep going. Okay, now this is a typical traditional Nusantara mosque. This is actually, I believe, from Indonesia. Okay, now that is called a sacred mountain in their traditions. And this was sacred to them before Islam came. So you're going to have three tiers, four tiers, five tiers. And, you know, it's uh, very good for the rain. It's very good for the heat and the humidity. 
and you know, also that it's sacred in the eyes of the people. So that's smart. Let's keep going. Here's another one. I think they're beautiful. Here's another one. Sacred mountains. Cosmic mountains, actually, it's called. Cosmic mountain. Let's take the next one. Another cosmic mountain. Don't you think that's beautiful? And if you go inside of them, they are so fantastic. You think there's a big carpet on the floor? No. It's, it's marble. Because, again, it's, it's humid there. Carpets like this, they're not nice after a while. So they want to have it marble. Okay, and then people bring in prayer mats and things like that. Okay, let's keep going. Another one, another one, keep going. Okay, now that is a big what? Drum, outside the mosque, cultural convention. What's it about? Calling to prayer. Haram, isn't it? Do you think they don't call the Adhan? Yes, they do. But they have jungle. They have thick forests, and sound doesn't carry well. The sound of the human voice doesn't carry well in the jungle, but drums do. So they have drum language. Boom, boom. And then they have certain beats that say, come and gather. Other ones say there's danger. Other ones say there's time for prayer. They speak the language of drums. Many people do that, in Africa especially. Drum language, okay? And so they put up these huge drums. That is an ancient Indonesian Nusantaran tradition. And we adopt it because that is the cultural imperative. This is something good. It suits the situation in those lands. Okay? And it's, it's, we're not going to stop calling the Adam. We do that too. But we also do this as well. Let's keep going. Okay, now here, if you look closely, you'll see that going into the mosque, this is typical in Santara, that you've got to wade through a pool of water. Well, what's that bidah all about? <laughs> Haram, right? Did the Prophet do that? Okay, why do they do it? Well, because they are a rice civilization. They work in rice paddies. And rice paddies can be dry much of the year. But in the beginning, the rice paddy is muddy, very muddy, and you've got to go barefoot. And then you've got this peasant coming to the mosque with mud all over his feet. So you're going to beat him and say, wash your feet, wash your feet. No. So he's got to go make wudu, usually. He probably doesn't have it. So he's got to walk through a pool of water like that to go make wudu. And of course, when he makes wudu, is he going to wash his feet? Okay. And then he's got to walk through it coming out. And then he's going to walk through it coming into the mosque. So basically, he's not going to track. Okay? And you're going to have to take off your shoes too, because unless you can jump really well, you're going to have to walk in the water. Okay? Now, there's a big problem with that. And that is that the water gets filled with all kinds of organic things. And you get yucky larvae and mosquitoes. So, what are you going to do culturally? Put fish in there. You see, beautiful fish. They can be those, what they call them, koi or whatever. Beautiful fish. And you know what? If you're hungry, you're going to have to eat that fish. <laughs> see, so this is also cultural imperative. Is there anything wrong with it? No, this is right. This needs to be respected. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, now we're talking about the nine saints. And we're especially talking here about Kali Janta, whom I love. And I know one of his great, great, great descendants. Her name is Shanti. And she lives in Jakarta. And Kali Jaga was, my goodness, you can't, can't believe his story. We won't go into it in great detail, but he was a great saint. He was like a Robin Hood. And then he became a great saint. And then he takes Islam to the Javanese. He was an aristocrat, very high family. But he takes Islam to the peasants, the rice peasants. And he teaches them Islam through shadow puppets. Those are shadow puppets. And those are his puppets. You see how skinny they are? How long their noses are? That's because there was another saint named Sunan Giri, I think. And Sunan Giri says, haram to make these puppets. Because in the beginning he had little fat puppets, traditional ones. 
So he goes back to the drawing board and he makes these and he says, so it's an Do you think these could live? But I don't think so. He said, I'm going to use these then. So this is Kali Jaka, and they're very beautiful. And then they all tell stories. They'll tell stories about the great encounter that you've read about between Hamza and Krishna, or Vishnu, or between Yusuf and one of the other heroes or gods. Of course, all made up, right? But that's the way they talk to the people. And then they teach Islamic ethics, they teach Islamic teachings, they teach Islamic beliefs. And also they're very smart because you had mostly the people there in Indonesia were Shivite Hindus, they were some Shiva, or they were Buddhists. So they knew what the Shivites like and what they didn't like. They knew where the Shivites get ecstatic. And so they play to that. And they knew that there are things the Shivites do that we don't like. So they left that alone. They didn't attack it. But we'll give you something beautiful. And so they bring the Shivites and the Buddhists into Islam through what they know. Again, remember Ahmad ibn al house. Didn't he know the Romans pretty well? Well, they knew their people very well. And we have to know our people very well. Whether they're black or white or Latino or First Nations or whatever they might be. Let's keep going. And more of his shadow puppets, more of his shadow puppets, keep going. Okay, now here we're going to look at Thailand. Thailand has a lot of Muslims and uh, we'll go through it quickly, but this is a little Thai village on one of the islands. And again, you know, it, 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 they're a little bit poor. Their mosque is very old, made from bamboo. But again, it fits in very beautifully. This is their imam. This is our, our brother Mansur, a lot of you know him. And he was there on his hunting. He went to Thailand with his wife. And they go to this island. They're all Muslims. They didn't know that. Of course, the Muslims were really good to them. So let's keep going. Okay, now let's go to India. There's, of course, the Taj Mahal. Keep going. Okay, now the oldest mosques in India looked somewhat like this. This is a model. Where are these mosques to be found? Kerala. Kerala. Okay, in western India. And Islam comes to Western India really early, uh, in the days of the successors. So these are mosques that were built by the successors, the Tabi'in. And again, they're based on cosmic mountains. A little bit different, but it's still a cosmic mountain. And I've seen about 13 of them. And they're really beautiful, really beautiful. And again, they don't jar with the local culture. They don't make a statement against the local culture. And these are the Salaf who did that. Let's keep going. You know, this is the Taj Mahal. Um, you know, this is undoubtedly one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. And a lot of this has been told by the ideologues that this is terrible. You know, this was a waste of money. They're not really wrong. But the thing is, this is politics. And this is culture, because the Mughals, and I'm not saying that what they did is beyond any criticism, but they built something that is so beautiful that it enables them to rule the Hindus and the Jains easier. That's very important. That's very important. And again, what is the logo of India if it's not the Taj Mahal? See, so again, we had cultural genius. Maybe we didn't have to spend that much, much money on it. And then maybe we could have made it a mosque instead of a mausoleum because his beloved wife died. Okay, we'll leave that for God. Right? I would like to do that. You could do whatever you want. But still, cultural genius. And if you look at the moguls of India, everything they did was that way. You look at the Muslims of Pakistan, India, genius, brilliant, brilliant. Let's keep going. Okay, this is the mosque. Okay, now we're going to Sri Lanka. We have any Sri Lankans here? No, I hope I don't embarrass you by asking. But this is one of my favorite mosques, the Pomegranate Mosque. Okay, and this was built by a man who we believe is a saint. He wasn't an architect. He wasn't a builder. But they had, they had to build a really beautiful mosque in downtown Colombo. 
and they had very limited space, so he said, I'll oh, copy the pomegranate. Because the pomegranate gets lots of seeds in one place, doesn't it? Uh -huh. And then also, what's the cultural aspect? Well, the pomegranate for Sri Lankan Muslims is a symbol of Islam. Because the people who spread Islam to Sri Lanka, they came from, from countries where they have pomegranates. They don't have them in Sri Lanka. So they associate the pomegranate with Islam. So it's a pomegranate moth. And I just think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I wish we could go there and pray there. And look at it. Look at it. Keep going. Look at that. Mm -hmm. look, look at that. That's a pomegranate. Look at that. <laughs> okay. 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 Let's go to the next picture. Now we're going to go to Turkey. Okay. Um, Islamic architecture. We believe that architecture is the supreme art. I believe that. Architecture and our our Islamic art, it really begins with prayer, with the mihrab, with uh, you know the voice, the writing of Quran, dress. You like to have nice clothes so that you can make wudu and you can bow. They're not too tight. So also clothes are art for us. They always work. We like to look nice. And in fact, when people don't look nice, it means they don't have self-respect. They don't have self and, and we believe in honor, don't we? And therefore we dress, of course, I'm, I'm not criticizing anyone, but we live in a culture that doesn't care much about honor. It doesn't, so we dress anyway. We wouldn't have done that in the past, would we? We wouldn't have done that in the past. So we like to dress nicely. We like to dress nicely. Now, uh, go back, go back, okay, so, our architecture was tectonic. And does anybody know what that difficult word means, tectonic? If you're architects, you probably do. But tectonic means it fits the earth. It fits the earth. And look at that. Isn't that incredible? You see, it's built to accentuate the mountain, because God created the mountain. And you can go through the Muslim world and see this everywhere in Turkey, in Spain, you know, in Morocco. We are tectonic. We want to fit the earth, the earth, and we go to Rosales, this beautiful place in Spain, and there's a Moorish house there that goes back to the Muslims of Spain. I believe it was a commander's house, because you had a lot of army people in that place. And he built his house on a hill, and he didn't dig out any of the hill. He built his house over the hill. I just wish I could take you there and show it to you. Perfectly tectonic, because God created the hill. So I'm going to make my house fit the hill. And you've never been in anything like it. It is so beautiful. The airflow is natural. The light flow is incredible. And it's just, you want to be there. You want to stay there. So we were tectonic. Al-Hamra, tectonic. Modern architecture tends to be anti-tectonic. Doesn't want to fit the earth. And modern buildings, many of which are very beautiful, without any question, but they usually say, look at me, look at me, look at me. Even if I'm ugly, look at me. Whereas our buildings say, look at the heavens, look at the earth, look at the mountains. It's different, isn't it? It's different, let's keep going. Okay, so this is of course Konya, and um, now this is not, there's a lot of Ottoman architecture here, but the main part, that turquoise, a pillar in the middle, um, of course you know it's Islamic, don't you? But what are they copying? Okay, let's go to the next picture. Do you see any similarity? That is an Armenian church. And so the, this is Seljuk. The Seljuks were before the Ottomans, they imitate the Armenian church in their mosques. Their mosques are not Armenian churches, but they build on that in such a way that they honor the Armenians because the Armenians were the most faithful of all the Midlands for centuries and centuries until the 19th century with the horror of nationalism. So they want to, because we need the Armenians. A lot of Armenians, of course, become Muslims. But we want to show them we respect you. We respect your church. We defend your church. That's what we did, always. 
And we will also build a mosque that makes you think of how beautiful your churches are. But you know what? Ours are more beautiful. <laughs> Ours than they are. Keep going. Okay, now we come to the Ottoman Turks. Okay, keep going. Um, okay, okay, so that is, keep going. Okay, you know what that is, right? Hagia Sophia, the first great church of Christianity, built by Constantine the Great in the fourth century. And of course we inherited because we conquered the city of Constantinople, and actually there are very few Christians left in the city when we conquered it. So we bought it, we didn't take it, we bought it, and then we turned it into a mosque, very respectfully. And you know, there are a lot of frescoes in it, now it's a museum, you can see the frescoes down below, but we covered the frescoes with a type of whitewash. We didn't destroy them, because we never do that. We just cover them because we don't really want to see them. But we don't destroy them either, that's always what we do. Respect the past, respect your people. Now the Hagia Sophia will become the conscious model of the Ottoman mosque. Every Ottoman mosque is a takeoff on Hagia Sophia. And you can say the Greek Orthodox Church. Again, just like with the Armenians, we now rule you, and, and the Orthodox loved us. Believe me, they did. We cleaned up the church, got rid of nepotism and corruption. Okay, the, the Sultan adopted the church. I will protect you. And he always did that. He protected the Jews. Okay, the Jews loved him because he protected them. Nobody else will protect you. You come to me. I'll, be, I'll take care of you. Okay, so, um, let's keep going. Okay, so, um, should we stop and pray to Shah? Okay, let's do that. And now we go quickly to West Africa. Okay, so, these are the great mosques of Mali in, in, the, in Timbuktu and elsewhere. And there, of course, you have desert. You don't have rocks, you don't have trees, you have to take them, bring them from far away. So um, this is how they built their mosque, out of clay. And in fact we're told that one of the great kings of Mali, I think it's Mansa Kankan Musa, he went to pilgrimage in about 1325, and Mali was so rich in gold that he caused inflation in Cairo for 15 years. You know, but he also got, they say, an Andalusian architect to come back with him to build mosques. But they told him, we don't want a Spanish mosque. We don't want an Andalusian mosque. We want an African mosque. So in any case, however the case may be, whatever the true story is, this is one of the great mosques of Mali. Let's take the next, next picture. Here you get another picture of another mosque. I mean, they're really beautiful, aren't they? And they fit in perfectly with the landscape. They're perfectly tectonic, and not only are they tectonic in terms of fitting the earth, but also the color. So they, they blend in beautifully. Um, okay, now we're really about to finish. So, Islam in Canada. This is actually, made, go back please. So this prayer rug is made by one of our sisters. And she's a professional weaver. And she learned how to weave from a traditional weavers. And so she made this prayer mat. Now, I don't know if you like it or not. You know, you might not think, well, I don't really like the colors. But this was made to fit First Nations, Native American symbolism and color. So to the First Nations of Canada, where she lives, this means the change of the seasons. See, so again, it's honoring them. And that's good for us. And it would be good for us also to learn why does it mean the change of the symbols, or of the seasons. What does the blue mean? What does the brown mean? What does the tree in the middle mean? Let's go to the next one. Also in Canada, you have a number of really beautiful mosques. And again, this is a very modern mosque, but then look at the inside, which is, you see? So they're doing incredible woodwork. And this woodwork also is Native American. And the carpenters are from the First Nations. In fact, a lot of them even became Muslims in doing the work. 
So again, honor the people around you. And I think it's very important for us to honor the people who are not privileged and who have been oppressed. You know, the blacks, the First Nations, and others. Let's keep going. Okay, now we're just about ready to end. Uh, this is our wonderful brother, Azim Ibrahim. And some of you know him. Very Scottish, right? I don't think I said that right, but very Scottish, right? And so what are they wearing? You know, that's of course a take tartan, Scottish tartan. But which clan is that? That's not McGregor. You know, that's not McGregor. That's not true. That's not. I'm trying to think of some other clans. Okay, what clan is that? Muslim clan. And this was authorized by Scottish Parliament as an official Muslim tartan. I think that's really cool. I think it's really cool. Let's, let's go to the next one. See, so maybe you can go up just a little bit. That's the pattern. So it's got green, white, black, gold. No, go, go back. Okay, so I can read the words beneath, okay? So, um, um, I can't really see it. Okay, so, okay, so, it says, um, blue represents the Scottish flag. Green represents Islam. Green represents Islam. Okay, keep going. Um, read it for me, please. Five white lines represent five pillars. The five pillars, right? The white lines, okay? And the gold lines are the... Six gold lines represent the pillars of faith. The pillars of faith. Isn't that beautiful? And then what does it say at the very... The black square represents the carbon. The carbon. See, so that's really... That is living by the cultural imperative. And that is telling Scotland that we love you. And Muslims should, because Scotland's been really good to us. And usually the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish, they're a little bit better than their cousins. Well, they're not actually cousins, but the English. Um, you know, they really are. They're much more tolerant. Scots especially, they've been really good. And the Muslims of Scotland, in my very limited experience, are among the healthiest. And they're also among the most dynamic. Okay, let's go. So I think now we've finished. And let's just open up for questions. Uh, we might not take too long. That sort of depends on you and what you want to ask. And then I think we might want to go home before it gets too late. Um, at least I might want to do that. But you know, I'm happy to stay here with you. Uh, as long as you have questions. Thank you very much for coming and sharing this beautiful theology uh, with us. Could you please also talk about cultural holidays? Uh, you know, in terms of how they fit in? Because there's a lot of debate among the Muslim community Thanksgiving, Halloween, Easter, Christmas. So, have you had a question, right, about holidays? Um, I think I prefer not to talk about that. And I'll tell you why. Because we say that hard cases make for bad law. And those of you who studied law, you know what that means. Hard cases make for bad law. So you're asking an extremely important question. But the thing is, what I want to do is keep it simple. Because the principles are very clear. Now, when we come to Halloween and things like that, that's actually not so easy. See, so hard cases make for bad law. When you study law, you want to get the basics. You don't want to go straight to the hard cases because you'll never understand anything. So what you've asked about, in my opinion, are hard cases. And therefore, I would prefer just to leave that because the main idea is clear. And adopting uh, the good cultures of other people you know, um, out of respect for them, that shouldn't be an issue. Now, how do we relate to their holidays? I could talk about that and talk about some of the things that are on the map, like even Ibn Taymiyyah has said about that. But I prefer not to go there if you'll permit me. Yes? Mm. Okay, I'll just, I'll just speak loud. Okay. Um, hopefully people can hear. People behind me may have trouble. 
Um, you were talking about the presence of Muslims. It's okay. You were talking about the presence of Muslims in America before Columbus. Usually when people get lost, we don't celebrate them, but somehow that man got celebrated. There's hard evidence of the African presence in America. You probably know the book, but maybe other people don't. Um, they came before Columbus. About various people came from different parts of Africa at different times of history. And uh, there's a lot of evidence, especially in Mexico. But I want to mention something that I never heard of until I was speaking on a program, Islam in Focus, in Los Angeles. And I got a call from someone, and they said, do you know there, is, there are these old buildings in, in abandoned villages in Panama, near, in the jungle area near Colombia, and there's Arabic writing on them. And I said, it may be Arabic letters, but I suspect it's actually West African languages, because if you see pictures of how West Africans decorate their homes, it's the same kind of look. And we know that. And then living in New Mexico for a number of years, about an hour's drive west of Albuquerque, and there are about only 12 Pueblos left, Native American uh, villages, and I absolutely could have fallen over because when you showed the West African, um, the most you there, they're in Jene and they're in um, Timbuktu and several other places. Those massive, they look like a dobe with the, the sticks so people can walk up and do the repair. In this Native American village, uh, the church walls are, I, I forgot how many feet thick of adobe, and um, then next to the church, and this is from the colonial period when the Spanish were here, next to the church is a cemetery, and the walls have the exact same look, the way they're designed, as you see on the walls around some of these masjids in West Africa. And um, we don't realize how... Muslims discovered America. Let's just tell the truth. Uh, people don't know it. And I think on Columbus Day, we need to say, we need a Muslim discovered America Day. And um, get people curious. In any case, thank you very much. That's yeah. very beneficial. And I believe that what you say is true. And I do have lectures on this. And I have also presentations on this. Um, to prove that Muslims were in America before Columbus, is much easier than to prove that Columbus was in America. <laughs> much easier. And uh, there's also a book, if you want to read about this, called How America Discovered Columbus. It's very good because, you know, Columbus did come over the ocean, but we discovered him and made him into a myth. Because he was actually a criminal. And I studied Columbus a little bit, and in the University of Chicago Library, I got a book which is the litigation against Columbus. The, the Spanish litigation. It's this thick, this big. This man was always in court. You know, he wasn't a good man at all. Um, and he's very self-promoting. But we know that, uh, we know this from Arab history, that in about 1315, the kingdom of Mali, under the Mansas, Mansa Khan Khan Abu Bakr, Mansa Khan Khan Musa, who were brothers, they put together a fleet of 2,400 boats, filled them with warriors, and dried meat, and water, and gold, and salt. And they left the Gambia River and go straight into the equatorial current, which goes to America. So even if you're not paddling or you don't have a sail, You'll get there in about 50 days. Okay, well they, they are warriors, so they paddle and they use sails. And in fact, they can come back, but they don't come back through the equatorial current. They'd have to go to the north or the south. So Mansa Khan Khan Musa, he told, tells us basically, I, I could show you this in the manuscript, that he believed you could cross the ocean. Okay, so this raises another question because if you look at the oldest people who have been discovered in America, and I don't know if I'm going to have a presentation like that in these days, you know, but I have roots, if, uh, or I don't, I'm sorry, but you know, I love this. And if you look at the oldest skeletons of human beings in the Americas, which goes back roughly to about maybe 13,000 BC and a little bit vague on the memory, 
Where do you think you find them? Well, you know they all came over from the Arctic, right? They came by the Bering Strait, and no doubt some did. Okay, but where do you find them? The first, Brazil. Brazil, way down in the south, and southern Mexico. That's a long way from Alaska. That's a long way. And when you take their skeletons and you put their faces back together by forensic technique, they are Africans. They are Africans. How did they get here? Equatorial current. Did they want to come or did they come by mistake? Well, we don't know, do we? But they came here. What is the oldest known civilization in America? Anybody know? The sisters? Olmec. And you go look at the Olmec heads. There's about 19 of them. They're made of balsite. They weigh about 30 tons each. And you tell me who they are. Africans. And I would say Mandinka warriors. In any case, they wear Mandinka helmets. Okay, and of course they can't be Africans. How could Africans be in America? And these are kings. And everyone has a distinctive face. Look at them. Some are laughing, some are smiling. These are warriors and kings. What were they doing in America? Well, again, they got into the equatorial current. Did they intend to do that or not? What I believe is they intended to do that. Why? Gold. You know, and this is one of the things, you know, that we're, we're told is that historians, if you look at the gold that was in the kingdom of Mali, no one on earth had gold like that. And some historians say they couldn't have gotten this from West Africa. <laughs> you know, and I could tell you that in detail because the people who had the gold mines, they hid them, even from the king of Mali. And they weren't Muslims, they were pagans, if you will. But they will hide the gold mines because they don't want anybody using those gold mines. But now we pretty much know where the gold is. And like this couldn't provide the kind of gold that we're told about that Mali had. They were always bringing it from over the water. That's what I believe. Even Mansa Kankan Abu Bakr, he goes with the ships. Why? Gold. Now Mansa Kankan Musa comes to Egypt in 1325. He's very generous. He causes inflation for 15 years. And he tells us they, we didn't see them after that. Okay, well, you know, they maybe didn't come back yet. But did they come back when he came home? We don't know. We don't know. They, they may have come back. I wouldn't be surprised. But, uh, so this is extremely important. And as our sister pointed out, we know from sound terracotta evidence that they were here. And you have, I could show you, I'd love to show you, you know, up there where you could see it. But we have, for example, many African faces in the Terracotta River uh, record of Mexico and elsewhere, as our sister said. You have one who is a very black Mandinka, very black, and he's got compound earrings, and he's, he's got a special dress. And I showed some of the Mandinkas of West Africa this time. They said, Donso, Donso, he's a hunter, because they know what a hunter is. And the hunter, you know, some of you might be hunters, but their hunters, know where the snakes are. They know where the lion is. And they know how to go. So if you're coming into the jungles of America, you've got to have it done so. Because they know the snakes, even though that snake is new to them. But they will say, go this way, don't go that way. Go by the water, don't go by the land. Go by the land, don't go by the water. And so he's going to be big, and he is. And again, we have um, Austrian, Archaeologist Alexander von or von Wutenau. Wutenau. Okay, he's written about this, and um, Ivan Sertema, von Sertema, who wrote *They Came Before Columbus*, the book that our sister referred to, he also refers to Wutenau. Wutenau is a first-rate archaeologist, and in fact, he found these terracottas in the basement of the National Museum of Mexico. Well, what's that all about? Because we don't want to be descended from black people, right? That's what that's about. They hit it up. These are noble black people. These are 
the better people than you. And Gutenau would show this black statue you know, to his students, graduate students, and they would say, it looks like an African, but it cannot be. There were no Africans in America before Columbus. Okay, so is that stupid? No, but that's cognitive frames. See, if you don't have the cognitive frame that enables you to imagine authentically that Muslims could cross the ocean, then you can't imagine it. And we know in New Mexico, that the, um, and maybe Arizona, the Apaches, the Spanish believed the Apaches were doing jihad. You can read it in their books. It's well known. And they believed that the Apaches had mosques in their camps and were praying. And of course that's absurd, isn't it? And that's what historians will say. They'll say this is absurd. No, it's not absurd. It's just you don't know anything about us. And you don't know that we can cross the Atlantic better than you can. And also that if we came here, we would have blended in with the First Nations by the cultural imperative. We would not have destroyed their cultures, and we would have lived among the Apaches as Apaches. But maybe some of the things they do, we wouldn't do. Maybe some of the things the Iroquois do, we wouldn't do. And again, we have a brother called Farouk Abdul Haq, um, Robert Crane. He was an advisor of, Kissing, uh, of Nixon before Kissinger. He's a good man. He's a Republican. He's a Cherokee. He's a quarter Cherokee. And when he became Muslim, he told his grandmother, I'm a Muslim. She's from the Wolf Clan which is the shamans, they're the ones who tell you all kinds of, they, they carry the knowledge of the religion. She said, we always had Muslims, you know, in the wolf clan, but we didn't tell the white man. We had a sister go there to the Cherokees, some of you would know her if I mentioned her name, but I won't do that, not polite. She's a Palestinian. She went down to North Carolina and met the Cherokees, a lot of other white girls with her. And they said, where are you from? She's wearing a scarf. She said, it's a long story. They said, where are you from? It's a long story. They said, please, where are you from? She said, Palestine. So you said, they said, so you think Cherokees don't know about Palestine? And then they took her, and they loved her, by the way. And they said, you're not like the others. You're not like the others, and I can tell you why. Because one of the chiefs, for example, was talking to you like I am, and he began to choke. And the, and the white girls got by, and they go, oh, oh, oh. And what did she do? She got up and got a glass of water and gave me a glass of water. You know, and so he said, you're not like the others. You're different. And, he, and they took her into this room. She told me herself. And they said, tell us if you recognize anything. She walked in. She said, there's the hand of Fatima. And they said, we have much more in common than you can imagine. And you look at Sequoia, the great Cherokee chieftain. And see what he's wearing on his head. Always a turban, isn't it? And his clothes look almost like Kurdish Muslim clothes. And when the Spanish came here, when Cortez goes into Mexico City around 1537, he conquers Tenochtitlan. What does he say? He said, We found muchas mezquitas y teocadis y casascantes. We found many mosques and indigenous temples. Teokal is an indigenous temple. And big houses. Well, you know that's not true, is it? He had something wrong with his brain. And I also had the honor to meet the Duchess of Medina Sidonia in Spain. Her family is a royal family. And they, have the, they are in charge of the archives of the Spanish Armada. Which means that they've got all the records of Seville in the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, um, because you know after they conquered Seville, then the Armada will be based in Seville. So she can't go back before that. But she has written a book in Spanish <coughs> called Africa versus America, la fuerza del paradigma, Africa against America, the force of the paradigm. And she shows, using her documents, that Muslims were bringing goods into Seville in the 1300s, but maybe not Muslims, but Spanish, they were coming from America. So she says the Andalusians were in America too, and they were there at least 200 years before Columbus. I believe that. And the conquistadores, everywhere they go, 
They report finding Muslims. Sometimes they find Muslims that look like Andalusians. So there were Africans without any question. And Africans are probably the first people to come to this continent. And there are a lot of things. So we've got to study. We've got to study, brothers and sisters. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, sister. We, we don't have a microphone? That's okay. I'll, I'll just speak loudly and if other people can't hear me. Well, if I can hear you, they can. <laughs> okay, so enough, your voice will carry better than you stand. So I just was wondering about your thoughts about names. Because, um, you know, either when uh, we as converts come to this scene, many people will change their name. Also, when we're um, naming our children, Mm -hmm. I saw an interesting post the other day in, in which somebody was speculating what, what would it be like if more of our Shiuk or Shekhat had names that were more similar to what people uh, that maybe we were doing Dawah with mm -hmm. would feel comfortable with. You know, so if it was Robert or, Thank you. or with Sally. Thank you. In any case, um, you're not required to change your name. If you convert, you're not. And only would that be required if your name were something not good, like Brandy. And you know, I, I know actually I have a cousin whose name is Brandy. You know, so like if you get Muslim, we might want to make it something else. Okay, like that's not really the coolest name. Okay, but um, you know, there are a lot of beautiful names. And like, have you ever heard of a Muslim named Javed? Have you ever heard of a Muslim name? Uh, Noshid, is that correct? Or Shirin, or let's keep going. You know, the Persian names. Okay, so how come the Persian names are okay and the Arab names are okay, but hope is no good? And you know, you could call a girl hope, couldn't you? You could call a person increase, which is Barakah. You know, and you know, so. You know, you don't have to do that, but, you know, it's actually, again, you know, we don't want to be aliens in this land. We do also want to be recognized as Muslims, you know, I mean, that, I have, I'm happy with my name, you know, but I'm very happy with my name. But the thing is, you don't have to change your name. When I became Muslim, like, you've got to get a new name. You know, you can't be Larry, you know, you, Larry means you wear the crown of victory. So it's not a bad name. Lawrence, but you know, so we don't have to change the name. Of course, a lot of times, brothers and sisters who keep their names, which is okay, uh, but also maybe you can have a Muslim name as well. And in fact, a lot of the African Americans in this country and the Moriscos in Spain had what and I don't know why they called it this, but they had basket names. And if you go to the Geechee Islands, off the coast of South Carolina, you'll find a lot of basket names, like Khadija, Khadijatu, Aishatu, and so forth. So they had a Muslim name, but then they had a Christian name, which they were known by. So she might be Mary, but she's actually Khadijatu, that's her basket name. And the Moriscos, who were the Spanish Muslims that were forcefully converted to Islam, they often did that. So they had a sobri Moris, they had he might be Pedro, but among us he's Mahmoud. So you can do that too. But, um, you know, you're free there to use your ifteha and don't make your family angry. And, and also remember that culture is not easy to change. So, Al-Ada Tabi'atun Thani, the cultural convention is second nature. Uh, you can't just change it overnight. People will not accept that. You have to go slowly, slowly. Yes, brother. Um, so you, you, you talk a lot about uh, Muslims in China. But one of the things I've been reading a lot about recently is how there's the different ethnic groups where one has typically refused to uh, try to separate from the Han Chinese and the Hui Muslims. And then you have the leaders who, over the history, have always tried to separate themselves. Mm -hmm. from the Han okay, Chinese. so this is a very good question. So, so in China, you have two major groups. Uh, the biggest one are Chinese Muslims, and they're called actually Hui. They're called Hui Hui. Okay, um, and so the Hui Hui or the Hui, they're the Chinese Muslims. 
And they're everywhere, John. They're everywhere. And they will always speak the local Chinese language, and they cultivate architecture and calligraphy and so forth. And then you have the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs are not Chinese. They are Turks. Okay, they're, 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 they're Turks. And they live in the northwest, which is called Xinjiang. Big, huge part of China. You'll also find them throughout China running restaurants and things like that. The Uyghurs today are really in trouble. Really in trouble. And the Chinese government is coming down on them really, really unforgiving. Um, there's reasons for this. Um, one of them is that there were secessionist extremist groups among the Uyghurs. I was in Jeddah. I taught there for 16 years. It happened that my best department head was a Uyghur. He was a Uyghur from Mecca. They had come to Mecca in the 1930s or 1940s. But he still spoke Uyghur. He spoke perfect Arabic as well. And I, I liked him. He was my best. And so these Uyghurs came to see us. They were young Uyghur extremists. And he, he wanted me to come, so I did. And we talked to them. And we told them, you don't rebel against the Chinese state. Do you realize what you're going to do? You'll bring death and destruction upon your heads, and that's not permissible in Islamic law. Don't call it jihad. You are not able to do jihad against the Chinese. They will crush you. Okay, this is the laws of jihad. You have no right to do it. First of all, you don't represent anything. You're not a state. Of course, they knew that we're just sellouts, right? And then they go back and they begin to blow things up and they do other things, so this brings hell down upon them. Now, I'm not going to say that that justifies what has happened, and I'm not going to say that that continues, because there's also a lot of prejudice. And in China, you know, this is something, again, like, where is our political representation? And we have some great countries in the Muslim world who, if they would just come together, Egypt, Turkey, Pakistan, if, if, we, if we get their houses in order, and if they were allied with each other as they ought to be, Egypt should never be alienated from Turkey. Turkey needs Egypt. Whether you like what's happened there or not, you need them politically. So if you had these three countries, Egypt, Turkey, and Pakistan working together, they could pull us out of the mud. They could. Uh, and I'm not trying to denigrate any Muslim country, okay? So please, if you're from other countries, don't feel that I think little of your country. But I'm just talking about geopolitically. These countries are extremely strategic. And of course, Pakistan does have a really good relationship with Turkey. They always have. You know, but we've got to have some kind of political force in the Muslim world. And these are really intelligent people, and they could do that, in my opinion. And, you know, of course, what are we able to do about it? And that's just ideas. But somebody's got to stand up for us. And the Chinese are always doing business with us. And the Chinese are doing a lot of business with Pakistan. Okay, so we should say, like, you know, like, we don't accept that you treat the Uyghurs this way. Right? And I hope and pray that someday we'll do that. Like, you know, that Pakistan has really good reasons for working with China. Because China is also a rival of India. And India is the big problem for Pakistan. And Indians do a lot of dirty politics, whether you know it or not, they do. They do. They dammed up the rivers of the uh, Himalayans that go into Punjab against international law. Does anybody take them to court? No, you can't, because Israel is there on their side. And, they will, and so they make the rivers in Punjab dry up. Go and look for yourself. And then when it's the rainy season, they open up the dams and flood the people. They do all kinds of things like that. Okay, so um, Allah enable us to find leaders in the Muslim world who will at least stand up for the Rohingya. You know, like, you can't do this. But we have no voice, do we? No voice whatsoever. And I hope and, I hope and pray that someday we will. Yes. Um, so my question actually very closely relates to what you were talking about. Um, so, and I apologize if this relates to um, 
maybe not keeping it simple, but since culture across the world, especially globally now, exists on a spectrum and isn't you know, binary, good or bad, um, where, how would you talk about accepting or going about finding the resources to better figure out what's more Islamically acceptable um, when it comes to accepting or um, taking upon the gray areas of culture um, that mm -hmm. comes in politically or ideologically with mm -hmm. isms? Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, so that's a good question, sister. Uh, I hope I've understood you correctly. Um, what I'm going to say is that, you know, one of the biggest problems in the world today is the destruction of culture. Okay, and especially what we call the global monoculture, which is leveling all culture. And that's a real big problem. And if we don't stop it, it will leave us with nothing. Um, I went to China the first time in 2002. We had an incredible trip. It gets worse every time, by the way. Yeah. The first time they're really nice to us. Times after that, they're not so nice to us. I've been there three times, okay? And, um, you know, so the second time I went was 2010. And, you know, I left Chicago in the Chicago airport. Um, I saw some boy there wearing a silly T-shirt, like, do it or something like that. And he had, you know, the jeans that are poor pants jeans. He pays a fortune for them, but he wants to show that he's actually poor. You know, you maybe you've got on those jeans. I don't want to offend you, but isn't that strange that you buy something that's ready for the garbage? <laughs> to show that even though you are rich, you're really not. Because no poor person could buy that, and they wouldn't. You know, they want to have jeans that work, right? And you know, so and I came into Beijing, and there was a Chinese boy with the same pants and the same shirt. So that's global monoculture, and it's a great leveler. So what do we do about that? You know, I say this is the greatest opportunity we've ever had, because we create culture. And like here in my country and your country, you know, I know we could create cultures that are so beautiful you wouldn't believe it. Taking from the African Americans and the Africans, taking from the First Nations, you know, taking from the Indians and the Pakistanis and the Arabs, taking from the whites and the Latinos, right? Going back into history. You can do whatever you want because basically the culture is either going or gone. Okay? But you want to have something that resonates with the people. And this is also very important. Have you ever looked at Shaker architecture? Do you know who the Shakers were? If you read my book, A Muslim in Victorian America, you'll learn about all this. Because Webb lived in the age of the Shakers. They were the biggest religious movement of the 19th century. And look at Shaker architecture. You know, um, it's really simple. Because that's their principle, is absolute simplicity. And I think you'll find that it's beautiful. Really beautiful. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody wants the Shaker staircase, which winds, by the way. And you have two. You have one for women, one for men, because they didn't mix men and women. But the Shakers um, made really beautiful things. And again, for them, always simplicity. So if we were to do something that were Shaker-like, most white Americans wouldn't know it was Shaker, but they will be affected by it, because it's in their DNA. And that's really, really important. You see, like, for example, this turban, okay? Um, you know, why did certain people put on turbans when they went to Afghanistan who were never wearing them before? And I actually know what they used to wear. They would never be caught dead with this, because this meant Sufi. But when they go into Afghanistan, they put on their turbans. And that's because the turban means something to you, whether you know it or not. And what does it mean? Justice. And again, it's like, you know, maybe you don't feel that, but this is deep in our Muslim culture. Because we are people who did not care so much about liberty, which is a difficult concept, but we cared about justice. And who were the people who defended justice? They were the great sheikhs and the great alims, like Sheikh Ahmed Sirhindi, 
that address somewhat like this. So deep in our DNA in the Muslim world, we identify the turban, especially on the head of a man we think to be a mujahid or a good person with justice, especially the common people, they do. You see, so that's what they wanted. That's what they wanted. And, you know, but what I just want to point out is that, you see, you have cultural responses that you don't know why you have that response, but it's in your DNA. And it's in your broad cultural background, you know, as a Pakistani or an Indian or an Arab or whatever, maybe African American. Okay, so the thing is, we have to be culture creators. And like, wow, could you ask for a better thing to do? You know, like, get the best architects, get the best artists, you know, and we, we have tailors in this country. We have a tailor in Chicago, you know, who is first rate, no question about it, you know, and, um, you know, mashallah. Well, I saw our beloved brother, Usama Khanan, let's make a dua for him, Al-Fatiha. I saw Brother Usama not long before I came to Southern California. He was wearing the most beautiful blue suit. You wouldn't believe it. And, you know, it's identified with us and with them. The fabric was spectacular. And this is our, this is our brother who is a first-rate dealer. And he imitates bird colors. And he does other things. He, he's smart. Okay, he's created, and um, you know, so that's what we want to do. You know, make beautiful clothes. You know, that are really respectable clothes, and your clothes are beautiful and they are respectable. But we can always do better. You see, and especially if you can get something that fits in, that rings a bell. You know, m my mother would go to church in the 1950s. You know, I go back a long way. Veiled. Did you know that? And all the other women in church were veiled. Did you know that? And they wear these big, beautiful hats. And they have a white veil over their face. In a funeral, she'd wear a black veil. That's what they did. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not saying you should wear that. But the thing is, is that, you know, you might wear a hat even. It is possible, and I'm not telling you to take off what you've got, but sometimes hats are really cool, and sometimes you can wear it under a scarf. But you know, it's like you can innovate, you can look for something, and for us brothers, hats are the big problem. And then I like your hat, I wear a hat like that too, you know, but like I'd like to have a really beautiful hat that looks really cool, you know, that can be identified as us. You know, but then also fits in. So I actually asked this tailor, can you help us? And he's working on it. You know, architects say there's no problem you can't solve. And tailors say the same thing. You know, and, and you know, so we need tailors. And, um, you know, um, anyway, God bless you all. And please forgive me. I know you've got lots of questions, but uh, I would like your permission to... Go get some sleep, okay, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay? Allah wafiqna bima tuhibbuhu tarda wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa amitna ala kalimati al-huda alimna ma yanfa'na wa wafiqna bil amali bima alamtana bih wa ja'alna nahnu fihi khalisan mukhlisan bi wajhika al-kareem ya rabbi al-alameen اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمع المرحومة وتفرقنا بعد تفرق المعصومة لا شقيا منا ولا محلوما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقينا عذاب النار Do you know one of the main things that motivates usually young, young Muslims to go join something like ISIS? Identity it's identity religion. I'm going to be somebody. I'm going to wear these clothes. And you know, the President of the United States would be afraid of me. And I would, and these people, sometimes they, they were never anything. 
a lot of them, you know, were just on the street doing drugs. Some of them owned bars. I know of three Bangladeshis uh, from England who went to join them, and they were just selling garments in a, you know, women's clothing store in England, really cheap and no big deal. And like you don't get much respect out of that, and probably don't even respect yourself. And so they went off to join them because we can be somebody. Okay, that's identity religion. And identity religion is a big problem. And identity religion is related to culture. Because your culture has to give you your identity. You see, your, your religion is not going to give you your identity, but your religious culture will. Can you make that distinction? That's very important. And this is also one of the effects of globalism. So if you talk about terrorism today, in our world, or in the Christian world, or in the Jewish world, or the Hindu, or the Buddhist, you've got to talk about globalism. And you've got to talk about cultural crisis and identity crisis. Just wanted to point that out, because a lot of people think, well, they just need to be taught. They're not. Actually, they don't study anything. You know, one of these people who carried out the horrible bombings that were in Paris and in uh, Belgium, his French lawyer said about him, he has the brains of an empty ashtray. And he said about him too, he never read the Quran, ever. And he can't read it in Arabic anyway. He reads French translations on the internet. And he said he's not politically motivated. He doesn't, he doesn't know anything about politics or Palestine or the big issues, right? But identity. I'm going to be somebody. And I wear those cool clothes and I'll be with the brothers. And, so, and women do the same thing. So that's what we call identity religion. And it's very dangerous. Very, very, and that's why you have to know that, don't you? And of course there are differences and variations and we need to teach the truth. But the thing is, is that we've got to give people identity. And you do that through culture. A lot of us, forgive me for saying this, are cultural zombies. Cultural zombies. Because, you know, maybe our families came here from the beautiful homeland. But like, why did you come if it was so beautiful? Why didn't you stay? And you came here, but like, you basically want your children to stay back there. And so often we do certain things when we teach them, so that we alienate them from the culture around them. You know, these are sinful people, they you know, do all kinds of horrible things, they drink wine, they eat pork, you know, and then we talk about how great the homeland is, and then you create a cultural zombie because he or she no longer belongs in Pakistan or Morocco or any place else. And when they go back, even though they speak Urdu, it's not the Urdu that the other people speak. It's got an accent. You have all these Turks in Germany, but when they go to Turkey, they speak with a German accent. To me, it sounds like perfect Turkish, but the Turks say, well, it has a German accent. So they know that he's not a Turk. They know that, and, and so he doesn't really belong. And then also, does he belong in Belgium? Where we have these brothers in Belgium that speak Flemish, that's one of the languages of Belgium, he speaks French, he can do hip hop, he can do break dancing, he wears a baseball cap turned backwards, but do you think that anybody cares anything about him in Belgium? Some people do, maybe 20%, but 80% of the population, they wouldn't give him the time of day. They wouldn't give him the time of day. So he also doesn't belong there. This is really harmful. And you know, I know a brother, he's actually the son of an English convert. His name is Muhammad, beautiful brother. And he recently went to Germany, I think to Berlin. And what a shock. You know, they see him and mashallah, he looks almost like us. You know, he's a little bit darker. He's got some Greek blood. You know, and then they see the same. They see his name as Muhammad. No, nothing here for him, for you. I mean, he, it took him so long just to get an apartment. That affects us, doesn't it? That affects us. So we ask Allah to bless us and enable us to use this situation that we have in the very best way. And uh, you know, you're so important. 
you know, because you are a generation of Muslims who know how to take care of business. And a lot of you, you know, you can understand this. You can do it. And, you know, you are in a country that you know how much of an effect it has on the world, for better or for worse. Right? But you're right in Pharaoh's house. And you can take this message to the people in a way that might be really good for this country. And it might be good for our democracy, by the way. Because I know when I became a Muslim, one of the amazing things was that I immediately became a citizen of the world. And if you look at China, for example, um, you know, mashallah, China to me was interesting, but that's a long way away. They're very different people. So I could never identify with Chinese. And forgive me, the Chinese that are here, but that's the way it was. And it's hard for me actually to identify with people that are not of my background. That's just the way it was, I'm sorry. But when I became a Muslim, it's like that changed. It's like now I belong to the world. And I could go anywhere. I could go to China. I could be at home in China. So Islam has the power to do that. I think you know that. And look at us. How many different colors are here? How many different ethnic groups? And we get along pretty good. And don't take that for granted. Don't take that for granted. That's really amazing. So we ask God to bless us and protect us. Allahumma ma manant bihi alayna fatanimu wa ma anamt bihi fala tasubhu wa ma adibtuhu fafirhu wa ma satartuhu fala tahtiku tamam ni'matika wa dawama afiyatik ya hayyu ya qayyum برحمتك نستفيز أصلح لنا شؤوننا كلها ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا ولا إلى أحد من خلقك طرفة عين ولا أقل من ذلك صلى الله على سيدنا محمد على آله وصحبه so thank you mashallah you came for a long time you know you sat there so politely and um, it's really beautiful to see you really beautiful inshallah we'll see you again inshallah we'll see you again